Good evening. Welcome to our Midweek Connect. I'm glad you've chosen chosen to spend some time with me this evening. Um, before we start tonight with our, our Bible study, uh, we have several announcements that I wanted to, to get out to you. Uh, lots of stuff is going on behind the scenes, and uh, I just wanted to bring you up to date, up to speed on, on some things that are going around. Uh, first of all, uh, we're looking into some great alternatives to our traditional Bible school. And I don't want to give you too many details about that right now, but just know that, that stuff is in the works. Stuff is being planned. Uh, we're looking at doing several smaller uh, camps this summer. Uh, we're looking into see how that would work and, and what that's going to look like. But just know that your leadership is working on bringing that together so we can serve our, our children this summer and uh, and deliver the gospel to them in in a fresh way. Uh, also, this Sunday, uh, this Sunday's worship time, we will be celebrating communion, receiving communion as a church. Uh, so, it's my hope that you and your family, as you gather around uh, whatever device you use, uh, that you will uh, be sure to have the elements there with you, uh, so that we can receive communion together as a church. Um, also, uh, you may have seen this morning, uh, some information has gone out through text, uh, through Facebook. Uh, I think we're going to have an email today, uh, about a survey. That survey is for our church members, uh, to kind of get a feel for, for how you're doing, what's going on, and especially your thoughts on coming back to church. I know that this week was a big blow uh, for everyone when we saw that the the time uh, has been extended with our stay-at-home order. I know that's discouraging, uh, but we'll persevere. Uh, the church has always persevered, uh, and, and we will too. And we want to, to follow our leadership, and we want to be safe and take care uh, of our, our neighbors. Uh, so I'm not discouraged. I'm a little disappointed because uh, I was really hoping to see you guys sooner rather than later. Uh, but uh, we want to, to be good neighbors. Uh, and we want, as a uh, intergenerational church, intentionally intergenerational church, to take care of those that we love, the most vulnerable among us. Other things we have going on. Uh, this is a big one that I really want you to... Uh, to hear. Tomorrow, um, there's going to be a, a special event online. And I don't know what your schedule is, if you have time to, to sit down. But I encourage you to, to uh, register for the Spiritual First Aid Summit. It's the Spiritual First Aid Summit. Uh, and, and I'll be sending out some information on that and, and how you can be a part of that. But it's tomorrow, uh, and all you have to do is go to the website, and I'll, I'll put it on the screen uh, right now below, and uh, go to that website and register. You don't have to, to be there right when it starts. It's not live. Uh, you can uh, watch it any time tomorrow. But I think it'd be good. Uh, Food for the Hungry, FH, who we sponsor and partner with, is one of the key sponsors of this event. And there are going to be some tremendous speakers uh, on how we can uh, love and uh, how we can minister to people uh, in the aftermath of COVID-19. Uh, my favorite author, uh, Christian author, uh, uh, N.T. Wright, is going to, to be one of the keynote speakers. So I hope you join us. That's called the Spiritual First Aid Summit, and that will be on demand tomorrow online. National Day of Prayer is May 7th at 6.30, and that'll take place on our website. And we have other ministers joining us to be a part of that, contributing. Uh, so you'll be able to join uh, with the nation praying on May 7th, 6.30 on our website. Now, finally, uh, I know some of you are getting antsy and our uh, ready to get out of the house a little bit in a safe way, of course. Uh, and, and you've asked, is there something that I can do? Uh, thank you for that, first of all. 
there are some things here around the church, some sprucing up uh, that needs to be done. And we've been doing some of that over the past several weeks as a staff, working on little projects here and there to, uh, to get things in shape. Uh, but we have some things that if you would like to do them, please call the church office and get a hold of someone and we'll line you up. There's some painting uh, that we'd like done. Uh, there's some weeds and flower beds that need to be pulled. Uh, there's a, all kinds of little uh, light cleaning things. Uh, our, uh, our custodial staff is doing some great deep cleaning stuff, but you know, there's some classrooms that can be straightened up. Uh, we have a whole list. So if you're looking to get out, uh, we're still going to be social distancing. We're still going to try to keep you as safe as possible. Uh, but if you want to come up to the church, uh, we're going to schedule that and space it out so people aren't here at the same time as much as possible. Uh, and you can serve in that way. We'd appreciate that. Well, let's get to our Bible study tonight. This evening, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews is maybe one of the books that we in Western society uh, in the New Testament read the least. Uh, and when I say Western society, I mean uh, Europe uh, and North America. Uh, we read it maybe the least. We study it uh, many times in the least. Alternatively, those who live in Africa, the continent of Africa, study the book of Hebrews the most. Uh, there have been great studies done on this and why that's happened and why this has occurred. Uh, but I think it's interesting and it's worth us reading. It's, it's a great book. Uh, it's been often discussed, who is the author of the book of Hebrews? Uh, in the early, early days, it was included with some of Paul's epistles, some of Paul's letters. It's clearly not authored by Paul. Uh, I don't think there's any chance that, that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. It doesn't fit his language. It doesn't fit his style in any way. Uh, there may be some common themes, but that's about as far as it goes. Uh, so you may ask, well, then if not Paul, who? That's a really good question, and I really don't have a great answer. There have been two more recent um, there have been two more recent proposals, uh, but there's just not a lot of evidence for any of them. Uh, the most popular may be Barnabas. Remember Paul's uh, associate Barnabas. Um, Barnabas was uh, a brother of encouragement. Uh, some people say maybe he wrote it. Uh, other people think that Priscilla, uh, Paul's uh, co-laborer, Priscilla, maybe that she wrote it. That would make it the, the only uh, biblical book written uh, by a woman. Uh, and it would also explain why it's anonymous, because uh, a female writer of the day uh, would have most likely written anonymously. Uh, again, we don't have a lot of evidence uh, for either of those. But it's always fun to speculate a little bit. Um, let's look at the text itself. We're going to start in chapter 1. And we, we may, for the, the next few weeks, jump around Hebrews for a little bit. Because I think it has a lot to teach us. And because it is so often overlooked, I think it's something that, that we need to get into. And we need to read and and see what it's all about. Because I think it's a valuable, valuable book. I think it's an incredibly insightful book. And I I know why it hasn't been studied. Because there's a lot uh, of things in there that we don't think about a lot. There's a lot about angels. Lots about sacrifice. Melchizedek from the Old Testament. These are things that, that aren't often uh, at the forefront of our minds. And so we think, well... Hebrews doesn't have a lot to say to us. It talks about all that weird stuff. Uh, I think there's a lot of value. And I think the first chapter, especially the first introductory uh, paragraph, is one of the most beautiful in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. 
In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purifications for, for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty, uh, the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. That's where we're going to stop. Um, and let's just get into this. First of all, it ends with discussion of angels and the rest of the chapter talks about angels and why Jesus is superior to angels. And I think we actually need to address that first before we go back to the beginning. Uh, because it, it has to do with the subject matter. One of the reasons the author is writing is because there is a movement going through the earliest church, uh, a very small movement, mind you, but a movement that said that Jesus was an angel. Uh, that's where his divinity came from. He was an angelic created being. Uh, and the writer is saying, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Jesus is superior to any angelic being because Jesus is superior to all created things. Angels are created beings. And, and the author is saying, you oh, know, Jesus is superior. So let's, let's read it again with that in mind and we'll go through it. In the past, God has spoken to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. Again, divinely inspired prophets speaking to the people of God was the way that the Old Testament was, was laid out. That was the primary means by which God spoke to his people through prophetic words by created beings, created individuals under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's how God spoke. But, and that was good. But, verse 2, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all th things, and through whom he also made the universe. This is incredibly important because it's saying that Jesus is not created. He is creator. Jesus is the one who is creating creation. These prophets were created by Jesus. Prophets are great. Prophets were wonderful, but they were still created beings. Moses was an amazing man, but he was a, a sinner and he messed up. Isaiah, my favorite prophet, was a, an incredible writer, an orator, uh, an incredible uh, revealer of God's truth but still a broken sinner and a created being. But in these days, in these last days, uh, the author is saying most recently, we are hearing directly from the Son himself. Jesus is the one whom the people walked with and talked with and they saw him and they heard him and he is not a created being. He is the one who creates. He is the perfect human. He is uh, the creator of humanity and took on uh, humanity into his very being. Remember uh, Philippians talks all about that, how he humbled himself and uh, took on humanity. He, he left his position of divine nature and, and humbled himself to take on human form so that he could redeem humanity. He became human in order to redeem humanity. And in so, 
became the second Adam. He became the perfect human. He became human like we were intended to be. He, he became human in the sense that um, he took on flesh, but he was the perfect human in the sense that he had perfect, unbroken relationship with God. He never sinned. He had uh, divine um, communication with the Father. Uh, he is who Adam was intended to be, yet perfect. So it is through him, through the Son, that all things were created, and he is the heir. He is adopted. He has chosen. He has uh, taken on all things and all of creation. He is the owner and ruler of those things. Verse 3 says, the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. That's amazing. So we've gone from he is fully human. He is the creator of all humanity. And he is also the exact representation of God. All of God's glory, all of God's radiance, all of the Father's glory and radiance exists within Jesus. What, what an incredible, mysterious thought that he's the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. His word is beautiful. His word is what he speaks and creates with. It, it is through his word that creation was spoken into existence. Uh, I'm overwhelmed by this beautiful passage. You know, sometimes passages grab us not because of their practical value, but because of their beauty and majesty. Some, some Christians get caught up in the practical, you know, uh, and they go to church, go to churches that are very practical. You know, uh, the sermons are preached on how to be uh, better in your finances, how to be uh, more successful, how to be a leader, how to do this. And that's good. And we need that. And that should be a part of our teaching. Uh, but sometimes it can be overkill. Sometimes passages of Scripture are valuable because of their majesty, because of their transcendence, because they're they're bigger than us and they're hard to grasp and they're just, they're beautiful. This is a description of Jesus and one of the most beautiful descriptions of Jesus in all of scripture. And the author is writing these things to say, yes, Jesus was fully human but he is completely divine. He may be fully human, but he is not a created being. He is a perfect being. He is beyond angels. He is beyond prophets. He is the exact representation of God. And this is huge for us because Jesus is also the one who suffered and died for us. So as we in, endure discouragement, we know that our Savior and our Creator has endured that as well. You know, I, I have a, a very, um, well, I won't say detailed plan, but I have some, some key things that uh, shape my Bible study and my devotional reading of the Word. And one of my primary principles is to always be studying Jesus. Yes, I, I study the Old Testament. I study Paul. I, I study uh, all the, the writers. But I'm always 
studying and reading Jesus. I think that's where our Bible study has to begin. Yes, go read and explore and, and, and do all these things and study all the books of the Bible. Become a scholar uh, if you want. Get in deep in the Word, but you should always be reading Jesus. Because Jesus shows us who God is. He is the uh, divine essence of God. He is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, and all things in the world are sustained by his word. Because of that, he is worth knowing intimately. And it moves beyond just studying Jesus academically. We study Jesus because we want to know him. Because we want to be like him. We want to be formed into his image. Because he looks like God, the Father. You know, Paul tells uh, his readers, he says, imitate me. Uh, that's a bold statement. Uh, I wouldn't say that to anyone. Uh, but, but he says, imitate me. Do what I do. Because I am trying to imitate God. I would tell you, uh, read this scripture and study Jesus over and over and over because he's going to show you God, the Father. You know, that's my desire. As we move through this COVID-19 process, we don't get to set Jesus to the side. Our behavior, no matter what happens and what we're told, should emulate and imitate Christ. My frustration that may come, in my frustration, I need to imitate Christ. In my discouragement, I need to imitate Christ. In my anger, uh, I need to imitate Christ. In my pastoring, in my shepherding, I need to imitate Christ. Christ is everything and all things. And Hebrews points to that fact. So we're going to be looking at Hebrews over the next several weeks. Uh, maybe just uh, a few times. We're not going to go through a detailed study of Hebrews, I don't think. Uh, but I challenge you. Imitate him. Because he imitates the Father. He shows us the divine essence of who God is and what God is about. First family, I love you and miss you. Uh, if you've got any prayer requests, let us know. If you have any needs, reach out to us. Uh, you're in our thoughts. You're in our prayers. And we're here to serve. Until next time.